Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shan Sensor CMO. This is a little bit of a different episode here. I'm catching up with my good friend Tom Goodwin. We recorded this in Cannes from our studio where we just grabbed a couple of sofas, grabbed some beers and just had a chat really. Unscripted, unformatted, just a chat between us about what the future looks like really, what inspired him about Cannes, what we would do if we were in charge, things like that. So this is a fun episode, uh, a little bit more relaxed than normal, but uh, a good one all the same. Hope you enjoy. So Tom, good to see you again. Very um, nice to be back. In fact, it's almost deja vu, isn't it? Like almost the same place. It's it's remarkably similar. It's it's quite a nice way to make comparisons, I guess, yeah. between times before. So what's happened the last year then? Uh, for me or in the world? Well, maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> Start with you. <laughs> um, with me, I've been launching my consultancy, uh, so I'm now getting stuck into what we have is now. Which I think um, broadly uh, best explained to this audience would be how do you take advertising thinking and apply it to really meaty business problems? You know, if you're a pharmaceutical company, how do you move from the business of making and and selling pharmaceutical medication into sort of digital products and experiences that allow you to make money on a reoccurring basis? If you're a department store, you know, what on earth do you do? If you're a car company and you have to sell through car dealerships, how do you manage that? You know, what do you do about up and coming Chinese makers? How will EV propulsion change the industry? So it's kind of taking um, an advertising approach to the kind of situations that management yeah. consultants. Only a me. small handful of small problems then. Not, not, you're not going to tackle anything big. It's, um, <laughs> it, it's amazing how big the problems are. Yeah. And I, I, I'm lucky because people come to me because they like my altitude of thinking and the degree to which I can be quite provocative. And as part of that, there's a lot of honesty required. And when you do speak to people who are remarkably senior uh, it's extraordinary how directionless some of these companies are. And in a way, I think that's that's a big theme to the world right now. Yeah. So to sort of move on to the, the sort of broader part of your question, I think in the last year, people have been quite lost. I think there's near endless talk about the next big thing and how everything's different and how the pace of change is faster. And I think in some industries, that's that's very much the case. But in others, the kind of principles and the foundations of what we do have not really changed that much. But people don't realize that and people are getting whipped up into a frenzy. Well, this is a good question because, um, uh, just to drop this into conversation, but we're talking to Smart and Sorrel yesterday. We did a a live thing at Cannes. I said to him, what's the one bit of advice you'd give your younger self? self?" And he he, he said he's underestimated the significance of the change that's about to happen. I mean, he was talking about the invention of the internet, you know, mm. 30 years ago. And he was saying, like, with AI, he said he he thinks, despite the hype, we're underestimating its significance. I mean, you are much more likely to be commercially successful if you put out messages that say everything you know is no longer relevant this thing is coming and it's extraordinary. And by the way, I have the solution ready ready to go. (laughs) As it happens, I've got this amazing um, 12 sort of slide PDF that's going to give you all the answers. So I think, um, especially from a position of threat, like like a lot of what I see these days, it's, it's not people saying we have this extraordinary tapestry of brilliant devices and amazing data um, and brilliant people. And we can now do all of these Uh, wonderful new things, let me help you uh, create these new things. It actually tends to be very fear-based where people are saying, unless you have a blockchain strategy, you're screwed. And I think what we've seen in the last sort of three years are a whole series of of chapters of fear that ended up changing nothing. You know, last year when we discussed Can, we were talking about how silly NFTs were, how stupid Web3 was, um, how naive a lot of the cryptocurrency provocations were and I kind of knew at the time it was all silly but people took it to heart and people spent a lot of money on these things and it turned out that was kind of a waste of time AI is not going to be like that you know let's be clear but I still think the nature of the conversation should be much more about positive things that we can do to be positioned better new possibilities that technology opens up and it should be sort of focused much more on consumers and what's important to them. And we probably talked about this last year, but something that's notably lacking in every single discussion that I see at Can is, is any sort of focus on normal people and the environment in which they're doing their best to live. Um, the huge fears they have about the amount of time that their families are spending on devices like a really strong sense of, 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 of concern about their everyday economics. You know, everything from sort of political 
polarization, to wealth and income inequality, to you know rising interest rates, to the cost of food. Um, I, I don't think anyone no. <laughs> on any stage has, has even sort of thought. You've about got a spare that. ten thousand pounds. You can get a ticket to the Palais, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I can do my bit to help inflation. <laughs> Um, and I, I don't sort of say that in a preachy way. I, I just think, um, you know, the, the role of a marketer is incredible. And ultimately, it's the only role in most organizations which represents the consumer. Ultimately, I can't remember which um, management consultant I'm quoting, but ultimately the role of any business is to create a customer. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's a little bit strange that we lose sight of that and we yeah. tend to get obsessed with I totally technologies. Agree. I mean, I mean, our, our job should be, first and foremost, to understand the customer, understand yes. what it is they need yes. and provide a solution to that need. I mean, yes. that, in, in its most basic sense, that's what marketing is. Yes. And I, I, I do worry, so, you know, you go around uh, the festival and, and you just see incredible demonstration and creativity. Yeah. But it's incredibly expensive and highly produced and involves the most talented people on the planet sort of thing. Yeah. It, which most marketers and most people don't have access to. You know? Yeah. I mean, I do think one of the interesting things about AI is it actually allows amazing creativity to be embraced by much smaller mm. companies. You know, the wonderful thing about social media is it democratized access yeah. to proper advertising platforms and proper data you know, for a small kebab shop or for a, yeah. uh, a hotel with, with three outlets um, to a tiny sort of you know, car repair company. Um, and I think the way that social media democratized access to advertising will see some elements of AI um, help democratize access to really good quality advertising. And interestingly, I actually think that means that for most of the people in Cannes, that actually won't make any difference to their job whatsoever. Yes. Like if you're making ads for Nike, like, yeah. like AI is not going to change that much. Yeah. If you're you know working on the P&G account or Unilever or uh, doing the ads for Amazon, like, it, it, like it's a nice little thing, but it's probably not that significant. And one thing I, I want to make clear is, you know, Mar so Martin is, is interesting to talk about how much change there has been. And that in some ways is true. But we never focus on all the things that remain the same. You know, I, I, I'd love to know your perspective on the amount of change that we've seen in the industry and what we're getting right and what we're getting wrong yeah. and how can makes you feel in that regard. So. Well, it's, it's funny, actually. I mean, if I, if I just put a, like a, a day job system one hat on, some of the most successful campaigns that we, we find haven't changed at all. Mm. In fact, I mean, we have this kind of phrase, familiarity breeds contentment. Mm. Um, and actually doing the same things that work again and again yeah. is competitive advantage, yeah. which sounds like the most insane thing ever. In fact, I, I, I wrote this column the other day for um, Marketing Week about an experience I had at uh, uh, when I was on Ribena yeah. and it was, it was a classic scenario right yeah. so you know we, we're there well actually the context is quite important because um, we're about to we had to reformulate the brand mm. because the government was introducing a sugar tax mm. and we were over the amount of sugar that was, you know you're allowed <laughs> to surprise surprise yeah exactly <laughs> two or three times you know it's quite significant um and so we thought, well, we better come up with a new campaign. We distract people, you know, we'll come up with a new yeah. campaign and all this sort of thing while we then slip the formulation into the marketplace. And um, it was one of those classic examples where we'd, you know, we'd spent months on the campaign. I mean, months and months, you know, evolving the creative, creative idea, you know, putting its focus groups. I, I just, you just had a feeling it, it, it was okay, but it wasn't going to be absolutely spectacular. And where this debate, uh, you know, me and the brand team, and they're like, look, we've got to make a decision because we're running out of time now. You know, there's, there's, there's a date when the formulation is going to change. And I thought, geez, how do we get through this? And I, I just said a simple thing. I said, tell you what, let's use the system one test, right? That's what it's there for, right? Let's just see what our audience think. And they're yeah, the know, only people that uh, matter. You know, exactly. Yeah. And, and the simple benchmark was, why don't we test it versus last year's campaign? Now, I didn't do the previous year's campaign. I joined in, in, in between last year and this year so i'd know i i literally had no allegiance to either one either one route mm -hmm. and so i said well put put the last year campaign and let's just see and the funniest conversation i have with the team is the results came back and they said oh good news bad news i'm like okay well give me good news it's the highest scoring campaign ever on the system one database the one that had run last year it was like five and a half stars or whatever i'm like this is amazing so what's the bad news well we want to make a new ad <laughs> and, and we've told everyone we're making a new ad. Yeah. I'm like, okay, we'll tell them that the old one is the best one ever yeah. and we'll do that again. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 it doesn't work like that because everyone's expecting a new campaign. Yeah. You know, all our retailers expect a new campaign. You can't go to retailers and go, oh, we're going to do the old one again. I said, yeah, you can. You go and tell them that not yeah. only have you got your old campaign, it's proven to work yeah. and you might want to give a bit more space on your shelf because do you know what? 
it might just sell more. You know, I think you're you're getting with, with knowledge. You're you're getting to the heart of a hypothesis I have, which is that. We're kind of terrified that people will think that we're not busy and that we're not getting it. Yeah. You know, like it takes a lot of balls to say, do you know what? We're going to do a TV campaign. Uh, we're going to have an amazing jingle. Um, we're going to do, um, <laughs> you know, pet, long... Pet rabbit in there. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do sort of long copy um, yeah. outdoor. We're going to have quite a simple media plan. You know, we might use social media and not have a sort of competition metric. We might just have really beautiful images that, that sort of work well. I, th- I think people are terrified within the industry. It'll look like they're not working hard enough. It'll look like they're not reading the press enough. It'll look like they haven't learned enough. It'll look like they don't get it. And I think almost everything I see these days in advertising is people within the industry looking at each other. And you know, going back to what Sir Martin Sorrell said, like we, the internet did kind of take us by surprise. And it's taken a remarkably long time for us to really digest what that means. We still haven't got there, by the way. But I think there is a reaction to every new technology now, which is because we were too slow to the internet, we're going to make sure that never happens again. And we're going to make sure that we're there talking about, you know, stochastic programming. We're going to make sure that we're on stages talking about, you know, real-time bypass in microchips that allows AI. We're going to make sure that we sort of really arm ourselves with the weapons in the words that we use to make sure that no one can accuse us of being too slow. And I actually think that's creating a massive disconnect between the advertising that will work the advertising that people understand and the stuff that we spend all of our time doing. So I, I wonder if it's as simple as the annual planning cycle. I mean, it's, it's a really odd thing, this, but like in marketing, you know, you, you come up with an annual plan and every year you feel obliged to change what you're yeah. doing. It's just a bizarre thing. So you've got the agency going, oh, what's our brief for this year? Mm. And sometimes the brief this year should be what we did last year, just a bit better yeah. or a bit more. Or, yeah. And also what it's, it's what you do with the time that that would liberate. So if you know what works, yeah. spend your time on the stuff that doesn't work. Or do you think marketers problem. get, I mean, uh, do they get bored or are they just oh, yeah. worried? Okay. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Okay. Well, the, the, another sorry, quote system, one again, another bit of research is last year, actually, we, we partnered with a very, very big global brand. And we looked at five years of their campaigns. Um, We happened to have five. We had, I think, over 100 of their campaigns on the database going back over five years. Mm. And we decided to retest all of them. Mm. And what we were looking for is, you know, as you do, just as an experiment. I I mean, everyone should be doing this, surely. Yeah. But what we want to know is, does the creative impact wear out over time? Mm. Does it wear out based on how much spend there was? Does it wear out because it's a different time of year? You know, we just wanted to change the variables and have a look and see what it did. It was shocking results because in every single case, <laughs> it's worn in. People liked it better. It's quite awkward, isn't it? I know. <laughs> it's just it's like, like imagine <laughs> making a car and then sort of figuring out that the sort of, uh, you know, the Ford Capri was a better car yeah, than yes. the, sort of the latest Ford Mustang. We'll freeze it there, right? That's <laughs> like, going to be the car forever. It's like, wait a minute, know, people I used know. to be better at their jobs. And there was only one exception. And yeah. the, the, the only exception... <laughs> which, again, won't surprise you, yeah. was um, in this particular category case, they sponsor sporting events, right? Mm. So when, they, when their commercial was linked to that sporting occasion, right? So the, Russia, the Russian Winter Olympics, I think, was one of them or something. Yeah. Unsurprisingly, yeah. the score went down because it yeah. wasn't relevant anymore. But all the non-time-specific bits of creative, the scores had all gone up. I think it's... it's I mean, there's, there's a big thing there. I'm always amazed by how often companies rebrand... Um, and often in quite subtle ways. And, and you do tend to think, you know what, like brands are so important. And they're, they're very weird because people really don't care, but they kind of also care enormously. Yeah. And there's a very weird sort of paradox there. But I think if, if the goal of a marketer is to get like a couple of sort of, you know, brain synapses aligned in a certain way and no more than that, you know, they just need to know that the tires that are made by... Yeah you know, continental and not crap. They don't need to know, like, the brand story and the the provenance of the rubber and, you know, how the design came about. They just need to know they're not crap tyres and if they... You know, if their if their son or daughter has a car accident, that's going to be something that wasn't part of it, and that means that the the notion that these things need to be consistent and stable and confident and broad um, and sort of heavy and, and simple, those things feel like very logical things to me, yeah. but the entire industry seems to be going the other way. You know, well, like Continental I mean, now would probably try to have like one-to-one conversations with <laughs> yes. brands and have like a 
have a sort of fifth air. generation tire compound, which is 10% <laughs> yeah. better in the wet. Yeah. Corners are 15% quicker. Uh, there's, you know? there's so much yeah. sort of uh, desire to, to make everything complicated. I, I'm, I'm, but I think that this is the di- going back to the disconnect between the consumer and us is, mm. is that we are so close to our products. And we, we think our amazing features and benefits need to be understood by everybody. Yeah. As you say, whereas most people want an easy life, they want simple. Yeah. I think easy is probably the biggest competitive advantage out there that no one seems to grasp. Uh, and easy in everything. You know, product ranges, I think, should be quite simple. I think sort of price points should be quite simple. I think the idea of sort of good, better, best is one of the most underused elements of marketing. Um, I think customer service could be incredible. Like, like I, I look at something like AI. And I think actually this is a remarkable mechanism by which you may one day, you know, perhaps in 2072, you'll be able to email British Airways and they might be able to reply to that, <laughs> you know, maybe within 24 hours or something. I mean, um, maybe. maybe maybe if if sort of, uh, you know, quantum technology gets to that level, like they'll be able to reply. I, I'd quite like them to connect my loyalty card number to the flight I actually took. Oh, that's on the roadmap for, for yeah. 2090. <laughs> so. I mean, but the, the, the weird thing about these things, uh, and I'm sure Rory Sutherland talked about this, this stuff really matters. Mm. And I'm sure within the corridors of, of their offices, they kind of know it kind of matters, but they kind of can't really put any um, sort of cost benefit analysis to it. Like they, they sort of assume that a TV campaign with this weighting will get this sort of uplift. Yes. But you could never really figure out what happens when you just stop miserable people like me complaining about British <laughs> Airways on Twitter. Always all my best performing tweets are me saying, I can't believe how bad the British Airways website is. And there's, there's no way to, sort of, obviously, I'm not important enough to, to be, um, you know, detracting from the brand. But it is one of those things that actually impacts the way that people choose their flight. And it's, it's unbelievably interesting to me how essential customer service is and how no company on the planet, almost without a single exception, ever thinks of it as something worth investing in. It's, it's always a cost. Well, I was having a chat the other so. day with, so, um, ironically, the owner of the local restaurant in, in the village I live in, a lovely, lovely guy. And, and he's, he, he travel, travels, we must have an amazing life, actually. He, mm. He's got hundreds of thousands of air miles. And um, he just said, I cannot possibly, sp- there are no qualifying flights anywhere I want to go at the time I want to go where I can redeem any of this. He said, if anyone wants to buy them off me, <laughs> I'd be quite happy. But it's like, not only does the app not work, you know, it doesn't even get the, the points right. And then when he's got a load of points, he can't even spend them. Yeah, these things are very they important are. things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I think I might have said this last year, actually, but I wish there was a sort of can award for the best sort of e-commerce experience, yeah. which allowed you to send back a parcel and sort of track it. Like, I'd love there to be a sort of a beautiful packaging slip i'd love there to be um a reward for the hotel that lets you sort of pick the room on the corner um even well, by paying sort of a little this bit is extra. a good conversation because we're here at the festival of creativity yes. the world's most you know celebrated yes. uh, what are the th- what are the categories that are not captured at can that should be captured um, I mean, customer service is the big one. I, I've had these discussions over a number of years, and every time it means that I'm less likely to speak on the main stage of Cannes because <laughs> they, they really do hate me now. But like this festival started out being about advertising, and then over time it became about creativity. But realistically, it's only about creativity as displayed by advertising agencies or maybe media agencies if they're allowed to stick their name on the submission or clients in their marketing department or ad ad tech companies. So there's no sort of creativity about an amazing, uh, I don't know, car rental company that's refurbished its um, sort of waiting rooms. Like There's no can award for um, the fastest checkout experience that just sort of blows your mind with how beautiful it is. You know, I, I think that creativity is everywhere. Like, um, it sounds tiny, but, you know, like uh, payment terminals, like whenever you sort of pay with sort of Apple Pay, you kind of get like, is eh, the noise, um, which always sounds like it sort of hasn't really worked. Like, yeah. like who's going to get the award for sort of making the sound on the payment t- terminal sort of go like, da 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 da, <laughs> you know, to mean that you've sort of successfully paid? Like, how, how can you sort of create like, um, like, a, like a banking experience, which feels quite nice? How can you... Uh, move your flight on British Airways just by sort of glancing your finger across the screen. You know, these things for me are actually much more important these days than advertising. And they involve um, both engineering prowess, but also um, empathy and also imagination and also ambition. And I kind of look around the entire world and I think, actually, you know, why... Why is the experience of choosing how to send a parcel abysmal? Yeah. Um, why is the experience of, of, of trying to tell your car rental company that you might be a day late? Why is that so incredibly painful? 
Because actually, these things really matter. The category I'd love to create for Can would be the zero budget category. Ah, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I, you know, I, I walk around and I, I feel very envious because clearly the, the people had a big, big budget and the yeah. production is beautiful and it was superfluous. The advertising was superfluous to the core brand idea yeah. or campaign and yeah. you know i thought they must have found a few million spare down the back of the yeah, sofa yeah, to yeah. put that that together and you know whereas actually i would love to do something with it. there's a startup that had no money yeah. and they came up with a really creative idea yeah. and everyone's talking about them now that would be great that's, i'd that's find that really, really nice. inspiring yeah right? yeah i mean even things like sent from a blackberry that's probably one of the most mm. uh, like successful marketing campaigns ever and it must have cost zero i mean yeah. just someone typing out sent from a blackberry that's really nice. I mean, for me, creativity is all about constraints, actually. Um, and if you've got a really sexy brand, like your job's a lot easier. You've got tons of money, your job's a lot easier. It's actually, you know, how, how can yeah. you work on, you know, Switzerland's third largest adhesive brand? You know, how, <laughs> how do you yes. sort of make that quite fun? Like, yeah. how, how do you sort of sell, you know, parity products in a way which is unexpected? Yeah. Like, without much money. Yeah, yeah that, that. I think it'd be far more exciting, you know. Maybe we should invent that. Um, Create that. <laughs> <laughs> they then have to spend a Real ton of money on that. I, I noticed these days the case study videos are absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. So, it, like, it couldn't be someone with no money. It would have to be someone with 25,000, but only to spend I've realized the floor in my idea, actually, is yeah. that people with no money haven't got money to come out to the festival <laughs> <laughs> and to sponsor the category that may be. It should be, it should be done. That, yeah, maybe they should make it free of charge yeah. then. Maybe we'll go to Margate or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just out of season. <laughs> we'll just, February and March. There, there is always this funny thing about can where you come to the sort of one of the most sort of obnoxiously nice and sort of wealthy uh, and sort of excessive place you know to talk about stuff which in theory should be about cost effectiveness and reality and i think there, there's always quite a lot of tongue-in-cheek things said about how this should actually happen in scunthorpe and then yeah. and then you'd really see who, who wants to, yeah. to talk about advertising and it's kind of weird to me that it stays in the same place. Like, it does. You know, for, for me, well, a lot think, of creativity is probably, about experiences. It was probably so. invented here before that, you know, anyone realised how big it was going to... I mean, you yeah. wouldn't pick June, would you? Like, really hot, you know, south of France. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, maybe it's just, maybe it's just big English, I live in Miami. Like, this is like a cold day. This is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I a coat in my bag. Rory said, actually, when he, yeah. when he came on, he said he, he arrived four days early just to acclimatise. Yeah, yeah it's like, it's it's like altitude training. Cost him extra four days in the... <laughs> Well, Carlton, uh, Ritz I, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about this, but you've now done a lot of podcasts. Mm. What's the most fascinating revelation that you've, you've had from it? I mean, I have to say, I think what Karen, we were talking about this before, actually, weren't we? What, what Karen Nelson feels doing with uh, attention is, is genuinely quite mind blowing. So, I mean, just to give the background to what she's doing is that she's worked out that, I mean, again, the best things are the simple things, right? She's worked out that what you pay for in terms of display advertising, in terms of advertising and the reach, number of people that see it, versus the attention that's actually achieved. So, you know, some platforms are better than others, but she's measured actually whether people, you know, how much of an ad people watch, how many, you know, and, and how quick the decay is. With like eye tracking or something? Or? I think, yeah, I think she sends kind of these, these devices out to, you yeah. know, to different people and then okay. measures, you know, uh, what they actually what they actually watch, and um, what I find fascinating about that is there's an enormous difference depending on the the, the platform and depending on the creative, mm. but you get this extraordinary difference in performance. So I mean we did this experiment actually uh, at System One, not with Karen actually with someone else that that does something similar, and we we looked, there was like a twelve x difference between a I guess what you call a low attention platform and a high attention platform, right? Yeah. But then there was another three times difference on top, depending on how good the advertiser, the creative yeah. itself was, right? Yeah. Now, I know this is obvious, right? I mean, you and I would intuit this, wouldn't we? We'd just kind of instinctively know. But the issue is that, you know, uh, media planning has been based on reach and frequency, mm -hmm. which makes an assumption that every yeah. opportunity to see is the same. Yeah. And it's vastly different. Yeah. And you sort of, and once you get your head around that, you look at it and go, wow, actually that completely changes how you might want to buy and sell media. So you really should buy media based on who's seen it, mm -hmm. not based on who could see it. And the difference between those two is like dramatic. So I think that's, um, that, that I think was probably the most sort of like profound yeah. Something I didn't know that I sort of thought, oh, that's... It's, it's a good example of how um, intuition these days has been sort of discounted somewhat, where you just Ooh. knowing that something is a good idea... Yes. 
um, after being in the industry for 20 or 30 years and being demonstrably well, I've, I've good got, at your I, job. I, like I, that's I, discounted. I, I invented so. what I think is uh, my theory of the marketing bottom. Yeah. So basically... <laughs> Someone who doesn't work in what? marketing, right? I'll, I'll, I'll try and describe this. My right? mind went to a very so, different place. Okay. So basically what happens is, and it takes about 20 years to draw this. But, okay. Um, so basically, before you go into marketing, you instinctively know yes. whether something's a good idea or not, yes. whether you're going to buy it or yes. not, right? That's basically. why you came into marketing. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But you go into marketing and you start to learn a lot of stuff that is absolutely bonkers. Yes. And you start to make decisions that are not <laughs> yes. what you would have done had you been a normal person. Yes. And you get this like rapid decline yes. in, your, in your ability to make sensible decisions. Yes. Well, of course, I need a 360 integrated <laughs> campaign. Yes. And you know, of course, I need to do, you know, a, 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 of course, my brand must have a TikTok strategy. So you end up doing yes. these really stupid You also get things. completely removed from what it's like to be a normal yeah. person. You're because, no longer a normal like, you're person. You're going exactly. to like Sainsbury's yeah. and looking for Ibiza yeah. on the shelf. That's and, right. Like, thinking all day yeah. about you know the, of the sort of brand onion for ribena well you do that's right and actually yeah. your thoughts on you know shoe polish or, or shampoo yeah um are actually more interesting in that situation yeah. because you can look at them like a normal precisely human. you got it right so yeah. so, ba- so basically we unlearn everything as marketers yes. and then and then we, we, our ability to make decisions is disastrous right yeah and then what happens is you discover this thing called you know books or theory or marketing science and then you begin to sort of piece it back together yeah. and eventually yeah. you get back to a of understanding at which you started, yeah. which most people takes almost a career to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> I think the um, the sort of paradigm of of data being really cheap generally and everywhere has also done a lot to accentuate this bottom, where you now almost have to use data to support any argument, regardless of how logical or illogical it is. Like I remember towards the time uh, that I was sort of leaving one agency, having a client where I almost felt like I'd need to present her with data yeah. to stop her from putting her hand in a blender or something. <laughs> you know, like I'd have to do a sort of focus group to decide if it was a good idea or not. And I think it's quite strange because actually a lot of data that we have these days, I don't think is that um, helpful. Uh, often it's measuring completely the wrong things and often it's very accurate. And people love really accurate data, even if it's actually got no sort of meaning whatsoever like google search results is quite a classic thing for me actually you'll see sort of google trend lines to show that you know in the fifth round of the you know democrat candidate elections this person's sky high on on google search and people seem to think that means they're popular and i always think actually that just means they don't know anything about this person yeah. and they decided to do a search to find out something about them like that that's sort of showing a mixture of sort of curiosity divided by current interest which is actually a sort of remarkably unhelpful parameter, yeah. but people yeah. love data yeah. like that. So. I remember doing a Google search, got quite a similar to that, and, and, and it showed this perfect downward trend in this particular topic. Yeah. And, you know, going down to nothing. I'm like, this really proves my case. Yeah. And then I looked at the Y axis, and the peak was 80 people. <laughs> and if it's helpful then you can keep that i just that. hide the axis yeah, i was gonna say like, if no one asked then it's fine there's been and, a catastrophic decline in people it, searching for my brand yeah, it's down you by know, like five thousand to 80 people in 2003 <laughs> no know. but like people love that stuff you know like even like time spent on a website like we don't really know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing like does that mean that they were um, sort of lost does that mean that the website was slow or does that mean that they were loving the times walking around different aisles of a website it could be the experience was so bad they just couldn't find what they're looking for yeah <laughs> it could be <laughs> like a newsletter sign up you know, actually having you know the, the shortest possible time website could be good if it's getting them to where they want to get to I think so on my book website like I've designed it to be the fastest website you could ever buy anything from and yeah it's fascinating I get loads of emails every day saying it was the simplest website ever and that's because I, I don't want people to do anything other than buy my book with yeah. Apple Pay as yeah. soon as they can I think the thing I hate is 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 the the gate you know where you go, you read something and go there's a really fascinating study on this particular thing yeah. and you go you look it up and it goes please provide 15 oh, lines yeah, of yeah. data about you before yeah. you can download Well, you know, it. you can just put anything in those. Like True, yeah. On almost all of them, you can yeah. sort of fill in, you know, FU. Is there an FU. auto com. generator? Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is a good use for AI. <laughs> <laughs> yes. AI, please. So which, which work that you've seen here are you most jealous of the fact that you didn't mm. do? Oh, that's a good question. I tell you what. Now, I mean, I usually, because I used to make work and don't make work, so I, I probably look at it through a slightly different lens. But um, 
Apple did, uh, Apple is shortlist for titanium. Uh, work. Now, Apple's unusual because I'm not a big fan of Apple advertising mm. generally because yeah. it's, it's usually way over products. It's usually just products over everything else. Yeah. It's like, here's a beautiful shot of our phone's camera close up, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. It's, I always think sometimes if Samsung did Apple advertising, people would really pan their advertising. Actually. Yes. It's yeah. only because yes. it's sort of Apple that they get like a free it, pass. No, it's actually. true. It's, yeah. it's a, Same with it, Nike as well. It's a weird. It, a Nike and Apple, the two brands that seem to sort of disprove everything, yeah. you know, and Red Bull for another. In, in, yeah. In, in, <laughs> Red Bulls <laughs> defy everything as well. But Apple's titanium ad this year is, is actually very, very good. And um, it's because they've done something about uh, disability. So it's, it's got some good purpose to it. It's beautifully, it's beautifully shot. But the reason I thought it was interesting was it just shows how, how much of a trend there is with the kind of thing because it's almost identical to a Microsoft ad from five years ago in the Super Bowl. And it's, it, it's one of my favorite ads of all time. I mean, if you go to what ad would I wish I had made sort of yeah. thing. And it, it's probably the... There's only two ads ever that have made me well up. I won't say cry. I wasn't bawling, but it made me kind of tear to my eye kind of thing. And this was one. And it, it, it was a very simple one. You've got, you got this dad and, and the son. And the son's severely disabled. And what Microsoft have done is invented a games controller that is, is enabling this boy to suddenly enter a world that he couldn't enter before. And the point that got me in this ad was that the, the dad said, he's not disabled when he's playing with the right. Xbox controller or whatever sort of thing. And I thought, wow. Now, I know that was a, you know, a big demonstration of a, of a product idea, but they've put it, they've made it really useful and really life-changing, you know, in that particular thing. And I've never forgotten it. You know, it just stuck in my head. Yeah. But it reminded me, because the Apple one, uh, the Apple ad is very good. It's quite similar to that. But, it's, but it made me realize that Microsoft ad five years ago wouldn't have gotten near an award. So it's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, the fashions change in yeah. terms, you know, I guess we're all about per a lot you more about Apple purpose. Budgets. We're on Apple's budget. Genu genuine. OK, so another 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 interesting thing here is I, I the other day I wrote down the five most creative things I think I've done in my career. And none of them had a well, the uh, top four almost didn't have any budgets. Mm. The fifth one had a reasonable budget, but even that budget was a fraction of the total budget that I had available to me. And interestingly, even with that one, it was um, it was a shot to nothing, as in I had some money left over yeah, yeah. and I said, Let, let's just do something. And yeah. we just decided to do it. So actually, I wouldn't want money. I, th yeah. I think I think budget, big budget makes you lazy. It makes you, t I tell you what I've noticed actually, because <laughs> you know, because weirdly in my career, I've, I've, I've had no budget. I've had small budget and I have a big budget. Yeah. The interesting thing is I notice what everyone does is they spend based on their budget. They don't yeah. go, they don't go, what are we trying to achieve? Yeah, What's yeah, the best yeah. way to achieve yeah. it? Which would be obvious. Yeah. They go, well, we've got 10 million. What does 10 million get? Yeah, well, yeah. it gets us 20 weeks on TV. Yeah, it needs to be big. Or, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. Which is lazy, you know. It's a fascinating thing to think about though, isn't it? Like how could you change that and... I guess to some extent that's how budgeting works, though, where yeah. you know the CFO will sign off on a certain amount of money per campaign. I've always had this very weird thing where half the clients I've ever worked with, if they put money behind a, a product or a launch and it went very well, they would then make an argument to get more money to support it. And half of my clients, if it went well, would cut the money okay. um, really? because it was already working. Um, and they would do the opposite, where if they started to launch a product and it wasn't working, they'd then sort of pull back the budget because they'd say it's That's not working. That's fascinating. But, but if you go on the basis that nine out of ten products don't work in the long run, if you get yeah. one that works, yeah. like go, go, go. Surely, yeah, surely it's just you always just, been uh, you, you pour as much as you possibly can behind it. Um, Tell that to some of my old clients. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, actually, well, one, of the, one of the best books I read, which you might have read as well, is um, A Great By Choice, Jim Collins' book. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the lovely idea, of, he calls it kind of load the cannon, but you know, the idea that you fire bullets, because innovation is risky. I mean, there's loads that will fail. Yeah. But he basically says, once you hit the target, put all your resources behind it because you've already yeah. proven it's going to work and literally See, fire I, the cannon. I think in these days, when you hit the target, people then think, oh my God, we're amazing at shooting. Um, let's keep shooting. We, we, should, we should move the cannon somewhere else. Let's buy a yeah. different cannon. No, let's shoot over let's there. Get... Let's go yeah. shoot over there. We're amazing this this. So We true. can shoot anything. Yeah. I think, and what um, happens in that situation? But then in that situation, you get so busy yeah. that you end up, Absolutely. the thing that's working ends up getting drowned out. Again, though, I think a lot of this comes down to a bit of sort of discipline in a way, really. Like uh, I have this sort of mental experiment in my head where I think if you got like an incredible marketing director from the 1950s, and you sort of parachuted them into today, they would probably have a horrendous time 
but they would probably be amazing at their jobs today. Like they'd well, probably be able to understand, oh, so what's this the whole internet thing? Okay, so it's a bit like digital display. It's a bit like display, but people can click on it. Okay, that's really nice. You know, let's let's do something a bit like this. They, they would be amazing at their job. My, my colleague Orlando is hilarious on, on this because he's um, he's basically used art history as, as, a, as a reference point for today's advertising. Yeah. And um, he was talking in his in his can presentation about 17th century Baroque art, and he categorised it basically into sort of display advertising, oh, uh, usually all the way. And 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 you look at it, and you go, it's exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a different you know media, yeah, yeah. but the style oh. when you've only got a limited amount of time versus when you you know and and the way they valued art mm-hmm. was basically is equivalent of valuing a display ad versus TV. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, you look at them side by side, and you go. Nothing has changed, really. I mean, you know, the technology's moved on, but actually, as human beings, the value we place in, you know, say for at the top, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a, a romantic scene with lots of, you know, kind of lots going <laughs> on like is, is, yeah, exactly, it's, exactly, it's, it's kind of like well, that's amazing. Uh, whereas the basic, you know, yeah. buy from here fifteen cent or whatever is, you know, it's, <laughs> like it's, a portrait it's not worth much. Yeah. That's amazing. I think um, I like how you talked about value there because I think somehow the industry feels quite small at the moment and it feels very fragmented. And I feel like a lot of it is based on this idea that we're kind of, you know, targeting people. It's it's very sort of aggressive language. There's, There's no sort of seduction. There's no sort of, you know, explanation. It's always sort of getting at people. Uh, I feel like the whole industry has become very dismissive of the value of a human being's attention. I, I actually think the media has become way too yeah. cheap online. I've, I've been saying I've been saying that for like fifteen years, and th- and therefore we we're not really having sort of particularly sort of big conversations about it. We're not really respecting our audience. We're not really assuming that we make something that's worth their attention. We're assuming that they're not going to notice, but it doesn't matter because it's cheap. And every year the Super Bowl happens in America and everyone goes bananas about all the ads. So the ads are generally big and quite often amazing. And it's always weird for me that for the Oscars and the Super Bowl, everyone cares about advertising, makes great adverts, assumes that people like the adverts, the ads seem to perform very well. Um, and then like a week will roll by and yeah. we'll just be seeing the same sort of crap Absolutely. out there. Half price deals. Yeah. It, it, if We've got data to back this up actually. So the equivalent of Super Bowl in the UK would be Christmas, right? yeah. where... And we actually we actually track the number of new ads that get released, the quality of the ads, yeah. and the length that the ad the length the campaign runs for. Yeah. So no so no surprise this the most amount of new ads at Christmas, mm. the best quality of new ads at Christmas, and they're the shortest campaign duration. Right. Mm. So, it's, so it's basically saying Very we do our best work, we spend our biggest money, <laughs> and then we <laughs> cut it and we stop it. Moving on. You know exactly. And the same thing as Super Bowl. Yes. So yeah. it, it is true. We we seem to do our best work and then forget about it. It's quite inspiring though, in a way to know that we can do this. Yeah. And the weird thing is, relative to the cost of media, like creative budgets are quite s- small. Yeah. So actually, I mean, I would say this coming from a creative agency originally. You know, the, the cost effectiveness of spending 50% more on an ad that is noticed, you know, three or four times more. Yeah. Like, there's, there's no better maths, really, um, given how that sort of affects the multiplier all the way through the kind of media yeah. uh, cycle. As well, well, this is a crazy thing. Again, going back to not throwing out stuff that works, find out what works, right? Yeah. Put it on the right kind of media, repeat, yeah. and spend the time you've just saved yourself to make your product experience yeah. a bit better. Well, the Christmas ads don't use celebrities that much, do they? They don't, no. That's the weird thing about the Super Bowl. Again, it's yeah. Just become, it's just become, okay, all right. Question back to yeah. you then. All right, here's, here's a quiz question for yeah. you. So 65% of Super Bowl ads feature a celebrity. Yeah. Uh, System 1 star rating goes from 0 to 5, well, 1 to 5. The average Super Bowl ad scores a 2.7 stars, mm. which is the first bit of surprise. So Super Bowl advertising is a bit better. The average, by the way, is about 2.2. Okay. So a little bit better than the average, um, which is a bit of a worry given the amount of money spent. But, yes. you know, but it also shows, you know, that they're, they're not necessarily appealing to everyone in the way they think they are. What's the average star rating of celebrity Well, ads? because you're saying this in <laughs> yes. the way you're Leading saying, question. I think it's going to be 2.4. It's actually two point seven. It's okay. exactly the oh, same. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interestingly, uh, the average score with, I mean, with characters that yes. are owned by the owned by the uh, brand, yeah. three point seven. 
So, yeah. so if you think about Super Officer, you've got like M&M's characters yeah. or Clydesdale, yeah. yeah, yeah. you know, people love you know them. All, yeah. the, all the things that are familiar, attributable to the brand, yeah. you know, are, you know, characters, you know, fun characters. I, I think the, the use of celebrity is coming down to two things. Um, I think the, the, the smaller of the two factors is I think people in marketing like the idea that they're going to meet someone famous. <laughs> yes. um, I think there is a little bit of that that goes on. But I think the main thing is that it shows that you're doing everything you could. And mm. I think, you know, having Samuel L. Jackson in your ads is the equivalent of getting McKinsey in. Yeah. Uh, where if it really doesn't work out. No one got out, fired by Yeah, you can McKinsey, just say, well, yeah. we did our best. We got McKinsey. Yeah. You know, if you can get McKinsey and Samuel L. Jackson together in the same room, <laughs> you're never going to get fired for life. Um, but I think it comes down to the same sort of defensiveness. And, and, and again, I think that's like a real theme that I see. Did um, someone actually, uh, is this urban legend or did IBM... Actually, have the strap. Actually, had the strap line. No one got fired using IBM. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think. No, I mean that, I, that was, was that, um, that that was a saying. Yeah, um, but I don't think it was. Oh, ever, it, wasn't, it wasn't ever actually. They put it on there. I don't think so. That'd yeah. be quite, <laughs> that's going to be quite kind of I'm just, <laughs> You're one of those things I've heard so many times. Oh, I yeah, wondered yeah, if yeah. it was true. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No. Maybe it's just a legend. No, no, I think it's a sort of truism or whatever those yeah. things are. Um, but it does a very good job of capturing the mindset of a sort of B2B buyer. It does, doesn't and, uh, it? Yeah, I think that's what's happening with celebrities. So what's the most impressive thing you've seen in Cannes? I think the balls of the ad tech industry. Like, I, I, I am staggered at the degree to which they come here and spend an absolute pile of money on sort of shifting the same products without any sort of product innovation and just the sort of smooths that they sort of bring. Like this festival, I think I've been here for maybe I don't know, 15 years or something. Um, it really has changed. And I think uh, it's, it's easy to sound miserable about it. I think it's amazing how much money has come into the industry from that direction. Um, but I also think it's amazing how little they've sort of um, changed the way they do things to be more creative. You know, like it's the same yachts with the same people yeah. having the same conversations with the same dynamics and the same parties that people get invited to and the same dinners. You know, they have the same panel construction. They have lots of people that come on the stage and don't say anything whatsoever yeah. um, other than what everyone else is saying. So I, I'm amazed at the sort of lack of creativity and the sort of the guts that it takes to just do the same as other people. When it comes to the work, which I know is what your question was really about, I, I, I'm yet to see stuff that, that makes me feel as good as I want to. I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on. This seems to be the festival of case study videos, not, not work. I wonder what percentage of films actually aired. I mean, I'm sure they did in some Somewhere, way, sometime. You know, in yeah, the Grampian yeah. region at sort of three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. I don't know, it's weird. I mean, I'm not a normal person. Like, I spend a lot of my life on Twitter. I spend a lot of my life talking to advertising people. I consume a lot of ads. I think about advertising a lot. And I've never seen any of this work discussed in any place whatsoever, other than the British Airways work, which I never saw in real life, but I heard people talking about it. And it does sort of make me think that... I think the the role of advertising in people's lives has changed quite a lot. Like yeah. in, in the 1980s, you always got the feeling that it was a very big industry. It was a very important industry. It, it didn't necessarily shape the culture, but it was probably part of the culture. You know, I'm pretty sure you could go to school and sort of, you know, sing I Could Do With a D, sort of like whistle that and people would know what you were doing or people could talk about Hamlet advertising. Or, and obviously like things have moved on and it's, it's unfair to compare it with that. But it, it now feels like a very small and sort of insular industry that mainly looks within itself. And it's mainly sort of grandstanding against each other. And I think that's a real shame because I think um, the, the power of creativity is extraordinary. I'm an unbelievable oh, okay. proponent and fan and supporter of creativity as a way to solve problems. It just sort of feels like that level of ambition has been kind of reduced and every, everything feels a bit like a sort of trick. Like everything sort of feels like they kind of sexed over the details in a case study video. Like everything feels a bit like they kind of hid the real results. Everything feels a bit like they kind of, you know, convinced the client to run it by sort of, you know, using some money they'd actually set aside for something else. And I, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't like how that makes me feel because it makes me feel a little bit more miserable than I really am. And it makes me feel disappointed in an industry that I have enormous amounts of respect for. Yeah. And it makes me feel a bit sad for all the people that work really hard and do really good stuff and work with tiny budgets. Yeah. And they put they actually go through the effort of making ads that exist in the re real world. And they, they, they actually stick up posters rather than taking photos of sort of mocked up posters. 
and it, that's, that's really what our industry is about. There's always lots of conversations about Cal every year and, you know, does it matter if the work runs because actually this is like a catwalk show, it's not high yeah. street fashion. And that's a very sort of powerful and seductive argument. And then you realize that a catwalk show actually has a really big impact on it the does. fashion world. I yeah. mean, maybe less so with people and like... the trickle-down effect, right? The trickle-down effect. You, you, you know, you're wearing it the following year, right? Like, well, not, not the exact version, but you're often but wearing the, a derivative the, the, of these that, things, And again, like, does that lead the fashion? Is that part of the sort of avant-garde of fashion? Like, you know it's, it's big and it's important and it's crazy. Yeah. Like, you see that stuff and you're like, wow, like, this is kind of fashion, but is it fashion? And then you see this stuff and you're like, I don't think this is setting the, yeah. the culture. I don't, I don't think we're going to see advertising or, or, or creative solutions that is inspired by this. It's small. And secondly, when you look at it, is there a sense of, oh, my God, you know, if you can do this, imagine what I can now do as a, you know, buyer in, you know, Zara or Topshop or Primark. Like, like I, I don't know. I don't know sort of where this lands with people that are trying to shift, you know, polyfiller. Um, I don't know what this means for a company that's trying to reposition themselves from petroleum to, um, you know, electric vehicles. Like, a, like it just sort of seems a little bit like cool kids. You know? Well, bring it back to the ordinary. I don't know if you saw this activation. My, my favourite activation this year has been the giant Cheeto. Have you seen the giant Cheeto? <laughs> <laughs> like, You're right. Huh? I know. Like, someone hit you over the head. Yeah, outside the palace, right? <laughs> really? There is this enormous. James, did you see the giant Cheeto? No. Okay, well, go and have a look. I think right. we so, need to make sure this, you're okay. Some, have no, you been sleeping enough? Yeah. There's, like, <laughs> someone, so there's, there's this sculpture of this hand, right? Yeah. And someone has planted a giant cheeto that's amazing in the ha- in this sculpture hand outside the oh, palette brilliant. with all the, you know you know how it get you know the cheeto sort of sticks to your hands <laughs> yeah, horribly <laughs> it's so. like they've recreated it outside the palette but what i love about it is last year one of the winning campaigns i think for strategy was cheetos and it, that was uh, okay. another super bowl ad uh, and uh, the reason i love that case study is is one of the rare moments where like the um it did very well on system one uh, and very yeah. well at can no. so it was very very cleverly devised it was it was a universal human truth about about cheetahs going back yeah. to your polyfiller yeah. very everyday products yeah but they identified what it is that people That's remember amazing. about it yeah, yeah. they dramatized it had celebrities as well super bowl up there there you go it does exist it does exist i take say. that back yeah. it's also a bit phallic as well so yeah no like you're gonna notice it slightly uh, slightly awkwardly looking in fact from the wrong angle it looks even worse um <laughs> but but like that must be the most noticeable thing uh, yeah, yeah. on the entire quasette yeah it's a giant cheetah no, in hand. see i see that and i'm like i love that yeah like, like i love that but someone came up with that and then they did it's it true and, and, funny. I, and, I, and like it's not very serious yeah. it's kind of cheap yeah, um, it's quite that, ironic. That for that me is the up. best. That's the best thing I've seen at Cam. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You see. Do you ever? Well, do you I ever feel that. like um, you should be applying System One thinking to all of the ads here, and we, that should all, almost, or maybe even yeah. actually, become part it's of the judging little criteria? Award. Yeah, we'd love that. We'd absolutely love yeah. that. I mean, we, we've. Uh, every year for 10 years, we've taken the UK, US winners, okay. put them through the system and yeah. just go, how do the people feel about the stuff that gets awarded? Okay. And there's been a marked decline. So yeah. 10 years ago, um, I think I'm right in saying that you would be seven or eight times more likely to get in the top, either a four star, five star, which is, you know, at the top of the database. Yeah. So, you know, there was very, very demonstrable evidence that winning a, winning a can award was clearly outperforming the average ad in the category. Mm. Last two years nothing no difference so the average score for can winners is the same as the average score on dope base for all other advertising and that should be quite a big deal surely because yeah. people are getting awards saying you're making amazing ads i mean yeah. i know it's you're making amazing creative ads but you'd have thought the fact they're actually yeah know, rationally not yes better ads that's it yeah that would now, kind I mean, of be a bit of yeah a i mean there's a number of little, little caveats in that we're looking at the the likelihood of it impacting over the long term right and actually yeah. what we see is there's a shift from long term to short term. Okay. So the, the things, the, the ads that are getting awarded are typically activations. They're, okay. they're not part of big campaigns. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. there's that. They tend to be three or four minute films. Yeah. And actually our data shows that three or four minute films, you've lost most people. Going back to attention, yeah, most people don't watch three or four minute films. They, <laughs> they drop off after 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds actually is the ideal length yeah, of time yeah. to capture attention, yeah. get a message and leave them with the right feeling. Yeah. So we know Did that. You get, so, we knew that like... I yeah, I know. I think Alan, about sixty years ago, there's a list of things we've known all along yes. that we've stopped doing that we need to go back to. Back yes. to our marketing bottom. It's like things we actually know uh, that we've yeah. forgotten about that we should know about again. Yeah, you know. So, so there are reasons. The other interesting change is we used to try and make people feel happy. 
Yeah. Now we try and make people feel sad uh, or, or, okay. or anger or disgusted. All so right. what we're trying to do is we're trying to shock people into feeling something yeah. about a, a cause or a brand. Uh, a few years ago, we were trying to make people fall in love with us as a brand. You know, we are trying to seduce them. Yeah. You know, sedu- so we've, li- we've forgotten the seduction and we've gone for the shock yeah. tactics. Do you ever measure seriousness? Don't, not specifically, okay. but I, I think I, if I there I'm, was a line for seriousness, yeah. I think that would probably I feel pick like it up. this industry used to be really good fun. Yeah. I mean, it had its yeah. sort of faults and, like, in many, many ways, it had very serious faults, but... It was always there was always a recognition that we were really lucky to do what we did, and yeah. that we were around people who were quite brilliant, often in quite strange ways, and yeah. we didn't really take things that seriously. Yeah, and now it feels very. Well, serious. I can slightly answer that, or adjacent to that. So we have been measuring humour and yeah. the decline of humour. Okay, and so percentage of award-winning ads that feature some kind of humour, right? Yeah, have declined. I, I, I'll get the data wrong, but from a you know a considerable amount to almost nothing. Yeah, and perfectly being replaced by purpose yeah so you're right so maybe that probably answers it actually is that we've yeah. become worthy and we've stopped having fun and we've we, we've you know become, and people don't like become it. Worthy. Like it doesn't and they like it less well. yeah 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 i don't know i'd love to see like uh, i guess we're going back to recycling ads but you know what if you just made like a like a tango ad today or something yeah, yeah. well that'd be a brilliant example like what would hchcl make today oh. I, I, I bet it would perform extraordinarily would. well yeah and people would love it, and people would talk about it yeah. around the sort of proverbial uh, virtual water cooler. Yeah. And yeah, I think. Well, um, maybe another award we could put in was the, the, the award for not changing. <laughs> <laughs> there wouldn't be many, actually. I mean, it'd be a short list. No. But like no. the brand manager decided. Actually, do you know what? There's, there's been a couple of examples recently. Actually, I'll go back to my Ribena example. Yeah. So um, Ribena celebrated its 85th anniversary this month or does has celebrated this okay. month so this is 85 years since Ribena was created and um, the team with great respect to them decided to rerun an ad from oh. 10 years ago oh 10 uh, years ago yeah, yeah. I but, thought you were going to say like they, <laughs> 65 years or something. no no no, no. Okay. well that they, well we actually slight, slight sidebar ITV asked us to put through the very first TV ad that ever aired yeah. ever Amazing. in the UK okay and it scored Three three and a half star, <laughs> which is actually in the top ten percent, right? <laughs> and That's honestly, amazing. if I played it out now, it, well, it black and white. Yeah. it's for toothpaste. Yeah, and you know, but it, it, I mean, maybe maybe it's the maybe it's the old fashioned accent that people were yeah. you know seduced by. You know that plummy British yeah. you know, BBC voiceover kind yeah, of. To some extent, maybe it doesn't matter why you know, it works, but, like but that it works. Yeah, is what but, but that the first ad ever to wear on TV outperforms eighty percent of toothpaste ads today. Wow. Sort of thing, you know. That 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 that's that, that's taking it to extreme. But back to my friends at Ribena, what they did is they, um, it Sarchi and Sarchi created the ad ten years ago. They currently work with BBH, and BBH remastered a ten-year-old ad by another agency. Now, mm-hmm. whether they did that willingly, I don't know. I have to ask BBH, you know. <laughs> but I thought fair play to the Ribena and BBH team. They go, do you know what the best thing to do is not yeah. change, you know. You don't you don't see many brands actually pulling on heritage anymore. I don't think mm-hmm. either. I think there's almost the same this this sense that the past is something to be ashamed by. Yeah. Well, actually, Orlando in his in his uh, in his lookout book deconstructed all the features that appear in advertising. You know, does it have a cat in it or something, or yeah. are there people touching? I mean, it's, it's incredible. He, he broke it down into loads of you know loads of <laughs> loads of uh, granular detail. Um, one, one of the one of the um, features was is it set in the past? Mm-hmm. And actually, ads that are set in the past capture more attention and create more emotion than the yeah. average ad. Quite drastically so, actually. I can really see how that. Imagine the, the case. Hovis ad. I was going to say Hovis. Yeah, is a Ho- Hovis ad is the classic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But the Hovis ad is forty six years old. And he's still a five-star ad on our database. Yeah. There are very few bread ads that beat Hovis from 46 years ago. That's amazing. And they may have had Ridley Scott, I know. But but it's just iconic, isn't it? And yeah. it's a timeless classic. It'd be, um, I don't know, it, it would be very interesting to look and see what would happen if these ads were run today. Yeah. And if that sort of process was normalised. And then in a year where everyone's talking about sustainability... Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's quite a nice thing to do, which is just to say we didn't fly people around the, the world... We didn't use a lot of electrical power to drive microchips to use AI to make an ad. We just found one on an yeah. old digibeater and we spruced it up a little there bit. So. I mean, uh, Rory had this theory, I, uh, this is from a couple of years ago, 
Uh, the most ecological thing you can do today is buy a second-hand Aston Martin. <laughs> so, because he it's said, classic Rory. Yeah, it's classic Rory, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a V12. <laughs> yeah. exactly. He said, well, all the energy's been used already. <laughs> you're, take, you know, you're basically stopping it, you know, you, you're yeah. extending its life yeah. and you're not, you're not consuming new. You're not, you know, you're not having to build He's never tried new. to get one repaired, I think. <laughs> I know. But the funny thing is, he said to me, he, he said to me, yeah, I, I was 80% confident that the Guardian would run it. But then I thought, no, there's just a small chance it might not, it might not be the right look I was after or something like that. So I was like... Um, okay, so final question. Yes. What will we be talking about in this podcast next year? Oh, that's an amazing question. I think we'll be talking about AI. You know, you, you, people know me well enough to know that I was very dismissive about the last tranche of technology that we had. And I think AI is very profound. I think it's not as profound as many people say. And I think it's going to take quite a long time, actually. I think um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if we're not all talking about AI next year. Uh, we're probably having more intelligent, nuanced conversations yeah. about it. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about what doesn't work. Um, we're going to be talking about it less as a way to do production and more as a way to learn about consumer behaviors, to do things like uh, change how we work. Yeah. Um, we'll probably be doing more sort of personalized advertising with it and trying to get that right. But I think, I think in a really exciting way, I think AI is going to be a, a big topic for a really long period of time. My, my concern is that we think that AI is the, the idea rather than yeah. the sort of enabler of better, uh, more clearly communicated ideas. But yeah, I think, I think AI will be I agree. Be I, I, yeah. I think in a, in a way there's more reason to celebrate creativity because AI yes. will do the stuff that actually gets in the way yes um yeah. you know and make efficiency gains that theoretically will mean actually the and also when everyone's got the same access the same tools then yes. originality creativity thinking they become even more important. they become actually what's more important so hopefully we'll see more creativity yes discussed across more spectrum i think so i think people will be a bit disappointed as well actually i mm. think i think the average person kind of expects this to to change every aspect of their life in the next sort of six months actually i don't mean the average person i mean the average person who comes to something like can and actually i think we're going to be surprised that it hasn't got that much better did you um, see the chat GPT generated McDonald's, Burger King, and Subway ads? I don't think I have. But so I so like McDon like McDonald's uh, did, a, did an ad that said, what's the most iconic burger in the world? Yeah. And then they had the chat GPT response. Yeah. Burger King said, but which is the biggest burger? Okay. Which had a Burger King response. Yeah. And then I think, uh, oh, no, sorry, it's KFC. Yeah. K KFC decided to do a handwritten letter describing, you know, how they, how they make KFC sort of thing, which I thought yeah. was very clever because it's, you know... Um, but I tried to recreate uh, what's the best, what's the most iconic burger in the world, and I got a list of different ones, including McDonald's, but there's a lot of yeah, others. Yeah, yeah. And it, first of all, said it's very subjective term. <laughs> yes. and, then I, and then I went, what's the biggest burger in the world? And yeah. Burger King wasn't anywhere near it. I got a lot of other yeah. famously big burgers, but not theirs. Yeah. So it just shows that your ChatGPT experience is quite, you know, you. Well, it's very varied. It varies a lot. Yeah. We, we see a lot of sort of survivorship bias, I think, with this, yeah. where if a million people use ChatGPT and three people get the most extraordinarily good result. Yeah. That's the one that's all over yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Like the 900,000 people that got something that's about as good as a sort of drunk intern. Yeah. Um, they're, not, they're not putting on Twitter if they are. But a lot of that stuff will get made. They'll, they'll be trusting the machine yeah. won't they, and putting it out. There, well, you know. I hope not, but you never know. We do tend to do quite a lot of stupid things. The one good thing I will say to end on about ChatGPT, yeah. uh, I had this uh, this guy in America did this spoof video of my podcast, basically yeah. a takedown of my episode with Bob Hoffman, <laughs> right? It was very funny, okay. but it was literally a seven-minute rant about yeah. He's not that uncensored. He, he called me, um, oh, what was it, tyrannical British bullshit or something. It was, it was like his That's how you're saved in my phone, John. You know, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I, I, I just took it in good humour. I had a bit of banter yeah. with him. But anyway, I messaged him privately and I just said, look, I, random question. There are many podcasts in the world. Like, why am I episode number two on your kind yes. of global podcast takedown network you've created sort of thing? Yeah. And he said, oh, I just went to chat GPT and asked for what the number one podcast in the world was, number one marketing podcast, came up with you. Oh. I'm like, oh, that's good. And I realised why, because when I first started the podcast as a joke, yeah. I just said, I'm launching the world's number one podcast by John Evans. <laughs> right. So I thought, that is brilliant. I've obviously that's trained the machine. Really brilliant. <laughs> that's amazing. That's worthy of a can winner. I there mean, you go. It's it's a, a, a growth hack. Creativity, no budget, you know, constraints, <laughs> using AI. That's, that's got to be, be there for next year. That's well, on that bombshell, it's been great to see you. It's, I'm so honoured to be on the number one podcast in the world. <laughs> Good to have you. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that slightly different format, uh, me chatting to Tom and uh, chewing the fat on what we'd change about the world and what we think is going to happen in the next uh, few years. Now, if you want to follow me, you can do. I'm over at Twitter, at Uncensored CMO. Please give me a follow or at John Evans at LinkedIn. And if you'd like to never miss an episode again, please do hit subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd like to watch, head on over to YouTube, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode again. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching.